welcome, friends, to another broadcast of a Heart After God Bible teaching ministry, teaching to take you deeper into God's Word. And um, recently, I've been going through the parables of Jesus. I'm going to do something a little bit different now. I'm going to take you through a number of the book, a number of Psalms, of course, in the book of Psalms. And the sole purpose is to help you to develop a, a more thriving relationship with God through the book of Psalms. That is, that the book of Psalms would become your devotional book, and you would learn to pray through it, you would learn to meditate on it, and the result would be that in, hopefully, that you would, you would be reading the Psalms on a daily basis. And as you do, your relationship with God will get stronger and deeper. You'll learn how to pray through the Psalms, You'll learn how to meditate on the Psalms, and the book of Psalms will show you glimpses and aspects of God that you you won't find in most other areas of Scripture. It's very unique in the way that it it brings us into a a deeper relationship with God. And so I'm going to start off uh, today from Psalm 1. We're going to go through Psalm uh, chapter 1, and so if you have your Bible, Please turn with me to Psalm chapter 1. And this ministry, I've said on every broadcast, this ministry, I'm looking to reach two, two different categories of people, but really they're one and the same. I'm looking to reach people who want to have, uh, they want to develop a greater heart after God. The impetus of this, this video teaching ministry began with my ministry to uh, pastors in Siaya, Kenya. Um, I travel there twice a year to teach and train uh, about a hundred pastors um, in Siaya, Kenya, along with my ministry partner Danny Gilbert. But they're they're I, I, one thing I love about them is they're hungry enough that they want to be learning uh, scripture uh, more in depth on a throughout the year, and so my friend Mark Biasotti has has consented to partner with me in this video teaching ministry. I'm teaching from my home, and uh, the the brothers and sisters in Kenya are able to download the video teaching and, and teach uh, the up-and-coming generation there as well. So that's the original reason for this, but I'm hoping to reach as many people as possible, and I would encourage you to take this link that you see on YouTube copy it and send it to your friends as well. And uh, I certainly would like to reach as many people as I can. And if you feel good about this teaching ministry, please do uh, encourage others uh, to watch. That would be great. Before we get into Psalm 1, I'm going to pray. And before I pray, I just want to say one word to a young boy in Siaya, Kenya, who lives at Ebenezer, uh, orphanage. He His name is Felix, and he is four years old. And uh, Felix, I haven't forgotten about you, and I just want to remind you that God's hand rests upon you for good, Felix, that you have a plan and a purpose in the Lord that he has for you. He is raising you up to be a leader for him, to make him known to others. You have a purpose, a calling, and a destiny, Felix. And my prayer for you is that God would ruin you for the things of this world and ignite your heart to be on fire for him. God bless you. Nyesai Ogwedi, Felix. And uh, for those of you who don't speak Luo, that simply means God bless you. Well, before we get to Psalm 1, let's pray. Let me pray for you, and then we are going to trust the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. And so I do say, come Holy Spirit, uh, come and have your way in our midst. You are our teacher. We ask you to lead us and guide us in your truth. Change us and transform us to become more like you, Lord Jesus, and help us to hear with faith and to be doers of the word and not hearers who delude themselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Psalm chapter 1, I'm reading out of the New American Standard uh, Bible translation. Psalm chapter 1, 
Now, the psalmist is, is anonymous. It could be David. We don't know. And he writes, how blessed is the man, or of course that's generic for, for women as well, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. Verse 4, the wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. In a short while, I'm going to lead you in, in some ways that I've learned um, in terms of how to pray scripture back to the Lord and how to meditate on scripture. And so the the goal is to help you see how much God's word can come alive in your life. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to define some of the most important words in this psalm, in Psalm chapter 1. But actually, before I do that, I want to tell you a little story. I was, I was a fairly new Christian in uh, 1983. I think I'd have been a Christian for maybe a couple of years and I went to a campus uh, ministry meeting and someone preached on Psalm 1. Well, I'd already read Psalm 1 many times and it was fast becoming one of my favorite psalms. But if I recall correctly, the, the person that preached on Psalm 1 or from Psalm 1 or taught from Psalm 1 really said something, and I don't remember precisely what it was, but the takeaway was that I could become a Psalm 1 man, that I could build my life as a new Christian on the Word of God, and that God really would see to it that by me doing that, He would do what He says He's going to do in Psalm 1. And so from that point on in 1983, I wanted to become what I began to call a Psalm 1 man. That is, I wanted to do what Psalm 1 teaches, and I wanted to trust God that he would fulfill his promise. Well, fast forward now, uh, this is 2016, many, many years ago, and despite all the hardships and the tests and the trials that the Lord has taken me through, I look back on my life and I see how faithful he has been to Psalm 1, how faithful he has been to his promises in Psalm 1 alone. And by his grace, now I have a long, long way to go, but by his grace thus far, I can say that I am a Psalm 1 man. Not perfect, not by any, any stretch of the imagination, but nevertheless, God looks at my overall life, and I am a Psalm 1 man, and he has made me successful in whatever it is that I've done. And so my prayer for you, those of you who are watching, is that the Holy Spirit would put it into your heart to become a Psalm 1 man or woman as well. Take God at his word, and you watch what he'll do. You watch how he will bless you and honor your commitment to him in studying Psalm chapter 1 and all the Psalms and really the whole uh, Bible. But right off the bat in Psalm 1 verse 1, the writer says, how blessed, how blessed. The Hebrew word is ashrei, but it's interesting that this particular word is in the plural and it's intensive. You and I can almost highlight that word or underline it. 
and it's and it's at the very beginning in the English translation, the first word is how blessed, but in the Hebrew, blessed is the very first word, which means it's emphatic, which means that the writer is saying, underline this, highlight it, capitalize it, whatever you need to do to understand that 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 the Holy Spirit is promising you that you will be a blessed man or woman if you do what Psalm 1 says. Now, what does it mean to be blessed? The Hebrew word means supremely happy. Friend, loved one, do you want to be supremely happy in life regardless of circumstances? Then become a Psalm 1 man or woman and you'll see how the Holy Spirit will help you to be supremely happy when times are going great for you and when they're not going great for you. It means to be supremely happy. It means to be fulfilled. It means to be fulfilled. People are searching for fulfillment in every area of life. And what, But what does this say about God? What does it say about... The Holy Spirit is inspiring the writer here. What does it say about God that the very first psalm and the very first word of the very first psalm is declaring to us, it's as if God is saying, I want you to be supremely happy. I have designed you to be fulfilled. That word can also mean to be highly envied. That is, when the wicked see the righteous and they see the joy that they have, there's an envy that comes upon them to such an extent that they want what, what, what a believer who's a Psalm 1 man or woman wants as well. I remember when uh, I had been, I had gotten saved and I'd been a Christian for about six months and I was dating um, or I was engaged to, to the woman that eventually would become my wife, Maureen, and she was not born again. But she saw my life change so dramatically uh, for the better that one day she said, Brad, I have got to have what you have. Really what, what she was recognizing is the blessing of God on my life. In a sense, I was highly envied. and She recognized that I had a fulfillment that she did not have. And so I was able to pray with her and, and she received Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Now, had that not happened, um, our marriage would never have been what it, what it is today. So, and the New, New Living Translation translate, translates Ashrei, Oh, the joys. I like the New Living Translation as well. Oh, the joys, plural. Um, uh, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of of the wicked. The Hebrew word translated not is under any circumstances whatsoever. In fact, it's the Hebrew word uh, for all of the Ten Commandments. You shall not have any gods before you, never under any circumstances. You shall not covet. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit murder. Never under any circumstances whatsoever. There's another Hebrew word uh, that can be translated not, but it's not nearly as emphatic as this one. And the Hebrew word is simply, the word is lo. We would spell it L-O. You shall, who, how blessed is the man who does not under any circumstances walk in the counsel of the wicked. That is, he is not looking to the wicked to inform his life. Now, he says, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Many Old Testament scholars think that this refers to um, in, in the society in which the psalmist wrote, uh, the wicked were in a certain area of the village or of the town. And if you went into that area, in effect, what you were doing is you, you were a green with that lifestyle. You were choosing to walk in that lifestyle. 
maybe it's somewhat similar to when I was in high school. Um, the athletes used to hang out in one particular area um, of the school, the cheerleaders in another area, the band members in still another area, the, the um, oh, what do I want to say that, I hate to say it, but the geeks, the intellectuals in another area, and the stoners in still another area. What are stoners? I don't even know if they still use that word today. But the stoners were the ones that were always getting uh, drunk or high on marijuana. They smoked. And there was just, it was a certain area of school that you just didn't go over to because, at least I didn't, because I didn't want to be associated with them. I didn't want people to think I was being associated with them. And I didn't want to be tempted to go down that road. So what what the psalmist is calling for is for the one who wants to be a Psalm 1 man or woman, uh, who wants to be a godly woman, to make a choice. To make a daily choice. I can go this way or I can go that way. I can choose to walk in the way of the wicked or I can choose to walk in the way of the Lord. Jesus talks about how broad is the 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 gate that leads to destruction and many are those who travel through it but narrow is the gate to eternal life and comparatively few walk in that way and so life is always every day is going to be about choices that we make now if we make the wrong choice and we sin uh first john tells us that we have an advocate with the father jesus christ the righteous we can go to him, confess our sins, receive forgiveness, make that choice to get back in the center of his will. But this is referring to a choice of lifestyle. How supremely happy or fulfilled is the man or the woman who refuses to walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners? The word nor, again, is low under any circumstances, refuses to, nor stand in the path of sinners. The sinners are in a certain area that you just don't go down. You don't go that direction because what's implied is that you're agreeing with their lifestyle and you are going to enter into that lifestyle as well. So he doesn't stand in the path of sinners nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Who are the scoffers? The scoffers are ones who persecute the righteous. The scoffers are the ones who mock the Lord. The scoffers are the ones who put pressure, ridicule, mock the righteous, those whose lives align with the Lord. And and they're trying really what they're trying to do is they are trying to pressure the righteous to compromise their relationship and walk with them because it makes them feel better. So the godly man or the godly woman who is really blessed refuses to do these things. And then we come uh, to verse two and we see a major contrast noted by the word, but, but his delight is in the law of, of the Lord. His delight, the, the thing that makes him happy in contrast with the twisted, perverted delight of the ways of the world is really his or her delight is in the Lord. And in this particular case, his delight is in the law of the Lord. Let me, ex- let me translate that word law. Anytime you see that word in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is Torah. Torah is spelled T-O-R-A-H, and and it can be and it can mean teaching or instruction. That's all that the law is. When you see that word law, don't think that it, it's related only to Genesis through Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, which is called the law of Moses. It is that, but that's not all that it is. The Torah is simply the teaching or the instruction of the Lord. 
You see that word over and over used in Psalm 19, for example, or Psalm 119. It's God's teaching. That's, that's really what it is. It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts. It is liberty. And he says his delight, verse 2, is in the law of the Lord. Now, watch this. Anytime in the Old Testament you see Lord capitalized, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that is the Hebrew name Yahweh. Yahweh. Y-A-H-W-E-H. That word, that name for God appears in the Old Testament by far more than any other name. It's not even close. 6,823 times we find uh, that word Lord. Again, all in caps, but the Hebrew name is Yahweh. And Yahweh has a very specific threefold meaning. Yahweh refers to God as personal, covenant-keeping, and active. That is who he is. That When he gave that name to Moses originally, what he was doing is he was saying to Moses, this is who I am. I want you to know me in this way, and I want you to teach the people of Israel, the Israelites, that that is who I am. I am very personal, unlike the pagan deities of the Egyptians. I keep covenant, unlike the pagan deities of the Egyptians or the other pagan nations, the Canaanites. And I am active in your life. And so one of the ways that, that I make Scripture my devotional book and one of the ways that I turn it around and pray it, um, I'm going to share with that with you right now. So um, here's what I would do when I'm, for example, when I'm studying um, Psalm 1. I would turn it around into a prayer and say, and I'm actually going to use the word Father, and I'll try to explain that a little bit later. I'm actually going to say, Heavenly Father, I want to be blessed by you. I want to be fulfilled I want to be supremely happy. I want to be highly envied. Please help me to daily choose not to walk in the counsel of the wicked, not to stand in the path of sinners, and not to sit in the seat of scoffers. Lord, uh, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain. Incline my heart to please you and to put you first in my life. And instead, Father, help my delight to be in your Torah, your teaching, your instruction. O oh Lord, and I thank you that you are personal with me. I thank you that you are active with me. And I thank you that you keep covenant with me. Now, let's just stop there. In just three, in just two verses, look at, look at the kind of, a relationship that I'm I'm having with God and now I'm not just reading the Bible as incredible as that is I'm interacting with the God who inspired the Bible who who really in a sense wrote the Bible through the various men that he used as biblical writers so so again let me just repeat I'm not just reading the Bible I'm getting a whole lot more out of it because I'm now I'm interacting with the, the one who inspired Scripture. I'm reading his word back to him. And, and as I read it out loud, faith arises in my heart. And that's the way that I read Scripture, or at least that I try to read Scripture on a daily basis. And it really is life-giving to me. So let's go back to Scripture. Let's go back to Psalm 1, verse 2. He says, but his delight is in the teaching of Yahweh, and in his teaching, he meditates day and night. That is, that the word of God gets deeply into his heart, and he's thinking about it throughout the day, and he's thinking about it throughout the night. That is, the word of God permeates 
his entire being, and it just oozes out of him, if you will. But notice what the psalmist says. He meditates on it. What does the word meditate mean? You see the Hebrew word. There's a couple Hebrew words. I think actually there's about three different Hebrew words that are translated meditate in in the Psalms primarily. You see it in Isaiah. You see it elsewhere in the Old Testament. But primarily it's in the Psalms. What does it mean to meditate on Scripture? Meditation, it's not a New Age thing. It's a biblical thing. And to meditate, the Hebrew word is uh, is is haga, and it would be we would spell it h a g a h, and it means to speak to oneself. It means to study. It means to ponder. That is to to get deeply within it and think carefully about it. It means to imagine. Uh, so again, let me repeat that. The, to meditate means to speak to one's self. To utter, that is to speak it out loud. To study it, to ponder it, and to imagine it. So as I'm meditating on Psalm 1, I'm imagining in a biblical way how my life is going to be changed as I give myself to the Lord and to his word. And so one of the ways that, that I speak to myself, that I utter it out loud, is I just declare it. How blessed is the man. I memorize it. I commit it to memory. And I think about it. How blessed is the man. How blessed is the man. How supremely happy. You see how I'm, I'm now focusing on it. I'm thinking about it. I'm pondering it. I'm seeing myself, again, in a sanctified way. I'm seeing myself as that, as that man, that Psalm 1 man who is, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. And I see myself saying no to anything that would try to get me to compromise or try to get my loyalty away from God. To follow after Jesus Christ, you're, you're in a spiritual battle. And the devil will do everything he can. He will send everything he can your way or any, any of his people your way to try to get you to lessen your zeal for God. And the psalmist is, is telling us that he's making that decision not to go down that road. And so, again, as I, as I meditate, how blessed, how supremely happy, how fulfilled, Lord, I want to be fulfilled, uh, is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. I refuse to do that, nor stand in the path of sinners. I refuse to do that, nor sit in the seat of scoffers but his delight. Oh Lord, give me more and more delight in your teaching, in your word. And in his teaching, he meditates day and night. Help me to do that. You see what I'm doing, loved ones? I'm meditating on it, but I'm also praying it as well. And so that kind of Bible study is extremely powerful it is life changing. And I urge you, I invite you, I exhort you, I encourage you to immerse yourself in the study of God's word um, in that way. Um, I'm not saying you have to do it my way. I'm just trying to give you examples. I don't want to make anyone a disciple of, of Brad Abley. I want to make them disciples of Jesus Christ. Well, now the, the psalmist gives us the outcome. What is the outcome of the man or the woman who, who does verses 1 and verse 2? Well, the psalmist says, he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers or he succeeds. Now, 
most of us in America, I think, generally speaking, take trees for granted. They're everywhere. We don't, we don't usually someone else maybe waters the trees for us. Um, we don't, we, we don't recognize the biblical importance or value of trees, but in, in a dry, arid land like Israel, where rain is not plentiful, uh, trees, and remember now when he wrote this, they didn't have grocery stores, they didn't have fast food, they didn't, you know, you, you couldn't buy boxes of cereal or boxes of macaroni. You didn't have refrigeration. You didn't have someone bringing you water or you didn't, you couldn't just go and buy a, a bottle of water at the store. You had wells that you had to dig and take care of, or you would have to go to streams and, and put your water in containers. Now, I've seen in Kenya little children carrying big buckets on their heads and going down to streams, filling up those buckets with water and walking back. You see, water is the key ingredient to life. Without it, life, we can't sustain ourselves. Water is extremely important. And then trees are what produce fruit, right? And so again in the United States, we think we think fruit is grown in supermarkets, so to speak. I mean, I'm being a little facetious. That's not necessarily the case, but most of us don't have trees that in our backyard where we pick fruit from. We go to the store and buy the fruit. Not so in biblical Israel, not so in much of the world. Um, the only way that you're going to get fruit is you have to go to the tree and pick the fruit. But the tree is not going to grow and the tree is not going to produce fruit without a steady stream of water. And so again, you know, I've been to Israel three times. It's, it's, I wish I could take people back to Israel with me every weekend. Um, it is so rewarding to be able to go to Israel and and teach people the events that happened in the Holy Land. But it is a very, very exceedingly dry um, country even today. Its main source of water is the Sea of Galilee. And um, even today, it's, they don't take, excuse me, they don't take water for granted. And so it's, it's just vital for us to understand that trees actually were even metaphors or symbols of life. Um, so if you had a tree that was flourishing and full of fruit, um, you and you were flourishing in your walk with God, you would be likened to a, a fruitful tree. So he says that, that the person who commits himself to live out Psalm 1 will be like a tree firmly planted by streams, plural of water, which yields its fruit in its season. Fruit trees don't bear fruit all year long. They bear fruit at the time. And so I think what's implied there is we have seasons of fruit bearing that, that appear to be, that seem to be more fruitful than others. And then, of course, Jesus teaches us in John 15 that the Father prunes us so that we may bear more fruit. And pruning isn't fun, but that's another subject uh, for another time. And its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. Now, that's a broad promise, beloved. Whatever he does, he prospers. Whatever he he does, he prospers. Let's meditate on that. Father, you said that if I live this way, I will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever I do, I will prosper. 
Now, first and foremost, God's heart is that we prosper spiritually. Because there are a lot of people that prosper financially or materially and are very poor spiritually. Much better to be rich spiritually toward God. And that Jesus speaks about that in Luke chapter uh, 13, verse 21, I believe it is. I think it's Luke. No, it's Luke 12, verse 21. He speaks about the man uh, that is rich towards God or conversely that isn't rich towards God. God wants us to be rich towards him. I talked about that. I taught through that in the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. I encourage you to look at that video um, because we, we can develop 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold fruit, which is 3,000%, which is, um, 10,000%, or 60, uh, or 100, or I'm sorry, 3,000%, um, 6,000 percent or 10,000 percent. That is substantial. Imagine if you could invest your money and get a 3,000 percent return. Well, spiritually, we can be that wealthy, and it depends on what we do with the Word of God, and it depends on how we care for our heart. So he says, and whatever he does, he prospers. That is, first and foremost, we are going to prosper spiritually. But then out of that, whatever it is that we do in life, God will add his blessing to it. I've been a minister. I've been in outside sales. I've been in fundraising. And I've seen how God has blessed whatever I put my hand to because I have endeavored to be a Psalm 1 man. Again, let me add, highly imperfect, a sinner just like you, but one of the things that gets God at God's attention is when we seek him first every single day and where, where we seek to please him, we seek to know him, we seek to obey him. And then when we sin, the Bible is very clear. First John 1 verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's God is pleased with someone who has a tender heart towards him, and the Holy Spirit can just whisper that conviction, and he or she repents of the sin right away and comes back to the Lord. And the promises in Scripture of, of his forgiveness are extraordinary. I'd like you to look at Psalm, I mean, uh, Isaiah 43, verse 25, which says, I, even I, have wiped out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not, the Hebrew word is low, not ever, 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 under any circumstances, remember your sin. That's pretty powerful that God would would make that dramatic of a statement to give us assurance that when we repent of our sins, that's it. God is not going to bring up those sins ever again, period, end of story. So we're, we're not going to be perfectly carrying out Psalm 1. However, God is looking at our overall life and and when we go astray, he'll discipline us. But if our overall life is bent towards pleasing him, we can be sure that he will bless us in whatever it is that we do. Now, here comes another contrast in verse 4. The wicked are not so. And it's interesting that the Hebrew word there again is low. It is, they are not so under any circumstances. What is he saying they're not so? They are not like that tree. They, are, they don't delight in the law of the Lord and the Torah of the Lord. They don't meditate in his, in his teaching day and night. And they are not going to prosper spiritually. Yes, they may prosper financially, but they will not prosper spiritually. But they are like chaff, which the wind 
drives away. The farmers then would take a pitchfork and, and uh, pull up and throw into the air wheat, uh, wheat and the wind, the breeze would separate the wheat and the chaff. The chaff was burned up and of course the wheat was turned into bread or whatever it is that they uh, you sought to use it for, primarily bread. Therefore, remember, remember the outcome of the righteous, those who gave themselves to the Lord, they would be like a tree firmly planted. Notice what the outcome is of the wicked in verse 5. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. Again, the Hebrew word for not is low. Under any circumstances, no no chance. They will not stand in the judgment. And the idea of stand here is of um, being able to defend themselves for their sin or, or really um, answering back to God. Uh, they, they won't have a leg to stand on, so to speak. That's the way we would use it. Nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Again, the Hebrew word nor is low. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. He is intimately acquainted with the way of the righteous. That's what the Hebrew word uh, knows means. The, the Hebrew word is yada. And we would transliterate that Y-A-D-A-H. It's the word uh, that was used for Adam knew his wife Eve. It is intimate, the most intimate knowledge possible. Well, again, that goes back to the nature of Yahweh. He is personal. He is active in our lives, and he keeps covenant with us. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So this psalm covers everyday life, doesn't it? But it also speaks about the future, that a day of judgment is coming. A day of reckoning over our sin is coming. Maybe maybe you're watching this and you, you are not a Christian. You have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. But in God's providence, he's brought you to watch this video. That is, the Holy Spirit has drawn you, and he is speaking to you right now through his word. And he's giving you hope that you can change. He is giving you assurance that your sins can be forgiven. You're a little nervous right now. You've got butterflies in your heart, so to speak, because God is doing something with you. How do you enter into a relationship with him? You simply ask. That's all you do. You don't pay money. You don't join some club. You simply humble yourself before him. And you recognize that you are a sinner. You already know that. You recognize and you acknowledge that you have not lived your life for God. You recognize with courage that that if he were to judge you, you would, you would spend eternity in hell. But you also recognize the meaning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the word gospel means good news. And the good news, my friend, of what Jesus Christ has done is that Jesus, God the Son from all eternity, willingly chose to become man and enter into our world and live a perfect sinless life for one reason so that he could be he could take your place in judgment which he did when he was crucified on the cross about 2000 years ago and though he was sinless, God took your sin and my sin and the sin of every person who has ever lived 
and laid that sin upon Jesus and punished Jesus in your place and in my place so that we could go free. That is the greatest thing that has ever been done. And you can receive what he did for you with a simple prayer, a simple prayer, but you mean it in your heart. Now, I believe that there are people out there right now who are ready to ask Jesus to be their Lord and Savior, as I did so many years ago. I'm still not sure when it was, 1980 or 1981. And I want to tell you, my life changed immediately. And I knew that had I not prayed what is called the sinner's prayer, I would bust hell wide open. And I was actually a pretty good kid. I didn't get into trouble. I didn't do drugs. But I knew that I was a sinner. But one prayer, and I was forgiven, and my life was changed forevermore. Are you ready to pray with me? If you are, then I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And you can repeat the words back to me. I mean, not back to me, I'm sorry, to the Lord, to God. He will hear you and he will change you. Let's pray. Dear God, you just say those words out loud. Dear God, I have not lived my life for you. But I understand now that Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive me of my sins and make me a brand new person. I need your cleansing. And so I ask you, Lord, I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my life right now. And I surrender my will to you. I surrender my life to you. I give my life to you right now without reservation. But I ask you to come in and live your life through me and in me. And Lord Jesus, I will live for you and serve you all the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus, that you have heard my prayer. And thank you, Jesus, that you have come in to my heart. And now, if you prayed that prayer, you, you are now my brother or sister in Christ. And I want to pray for you. I want to welcome you into the family of God. The Bible says that, that you are now his son or, or his daughter in Christ Jesus. And I want to welcome you into the family of God. You know, I'm not going to shout right now, but the Bible says there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous. There is more joy in heaven. I will guarantee you that there is joy going on in heaven right now. And it's loud because of what you have done. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for each and every person that, that prayed that prayer just now. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would visit them in a mighty way. That you would protect them from the evil one who will now fight hard to pull them back into the world. I pray that you would cut off the ties to the world and just catapult them into the run of your purposes. Help them to hunger and thirst for you and seek you and search for you with all of their hearts all the days of their lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you would like to, one of the best things to do, the most important things to do after you pray a prayer like that is to tell someone. And so 
tell someone. If you'd like to, email me and share with me. I would be very encouraged. Email me and tell me what happened. Uh, my email address is brad.abley, A-B-L-E-Y, at gmail.com. Brad.abley, at gmail.com. Email me and let me know what it is that you did, and let me celebrate and rejoice with you. Well, my time is just about up. I, I want to say thank you for joining me today, and I pray that uh, with this study in Psalm 1 that you are moving forward to having a, a greater heart after God, that you're learning, or maybe some of you are just being refreshed with how to pray through the Word of God, how to meditate on the Word of God, and really talk to the one that wrote this Word with you in mind. Now, there are others out there that uh, you've been a believer for many, many years, and you could partner with me financially. Uh, I make my living by the gospel, and I, and I need people to to fund me to be able to do more trips uh, back to Africa. And, um, and I'm just about to begin a radio broadcast ministry into about 75% of the nation of Africa through the Voice of Hope Africa. And um, I, I could use your financial support. You'll never see me beg for money, not a chance. But if the Holy Spirit is moving upon you to partner with me, either with a one-time gift or a monthly gift, um, I would be extremely grateful to you. The ministry name, uh, you'd write a check out to Empowered Living International Ministries. And in the lower uh, corner of that check, um, just write in uh, 31160, and that'll get to me. And... Um, or if you want to give <clears throat> online, just go to the website that Mark will show on the screen, Empowered Living International Ministries, and there's a place on the website to be able to give online. Um, I pray that as you, if the Lord leads you to give, that he would bless you greatly and that you would recognize that you're not just giving but you're partnering with me, that you would keep in mind that I greatly, greatly appreciate it and that you're now co-laboring with me in the gospel to build the church in Siaya, Kenya, uh, to help me to invest time to be able to do radio ministry and, and many other aspects of ministry as well. I'm writing commentaries to get into the hands of Africans. Um, in fact, I've just finished a, a commentary on 1 Thessalonians and I've done uh, Revelation chapters 1 through 11, which would be volume 1. And I want to get those published, self-publishing most likely, and put them into the hands of as many Kenyans and Africans as I can. I want to get them uh, published uh, paperback and um, uh, e-books as well. But I need the finances to be able to pay for that. And so you could partner with me in that as well. Well, let me close by praying for you and just pronouncing God's blessing upon you. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, both now and forevermore, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Well, I look forward to uh, doing another study soon in another psalm. Be looking for that on YouTube. May the Lord bless you greatly is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.